I'm Bill Rapisi, President and CEO of the Lymphatic Education and Research Network, and I just want to welcome you and say how delighted we are to have people from all over the world uh, here today for this brilliant symposium. It's our honor to be able to present these to you free of charge, but that's only possible thanks to LEARN donors, and that's where you come in. This is the time of year when LEARN has its annual appeal. And right now you have an opportunity to double your impact thanks to a donation from Ian Lehman and Stephanie Free, who gave us $50,000 as a match. So when you see the button to give to the appeal during the symposium, please give generously so that we can continue to bring this programming to the world and continue to fight against lymphedema, lipedema, lymphatic malformations, and all lymphatic diseases. Thanks for your time. And remember, when you see the button to double your impact, please click it. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Catherine Sayo, and along with my colleagues, Dr. Matt Carmody, Leslie Keith, and Megan Pfeffer, we're here to share with you today some foundational concepts in lipedema with some very promising trends for diagnosis, wellness, care, and using a multidisciplinary approach. So a shout out to the sponsors. It's with the sponsors' generosity that things like this webinar can happen and many of the other things that happen with LEARN. And a disclaimer. Um, sponsored information is provided for use for you in consultation with your healthcare professional and is not meant to take the place of healthcare or services you may need. Please see your primary healthcare provider about any personal health concerns. And our agenda for today, um, we'll each take somewhere between eight to 10 to 12 minutes. And um, each of us will um, be focusing on one aspect of what is a multidimensional approach to lipedema. So I'll start with an evolving collaborative multidisciplinary holistic approach to the treatment for lipedema. And Dr. Carmody will talk about the clinical and non-clinical approaches to lipedema diagnosis with um, Megan Pfeffer, um, therapeutic nutrition for lipedema, a new perspective. And we'll wrap up with Leslyn Keith talking about new trends in treatment for lipedema. And then we'll have a Q&A. So please put any questions that you have as we go along in the Q&A box. And at the end, we've allotted a 15 to 20 minute time session to answer your questions. Uh, my disclosures, I'm um, director and producer and co-author of the documentary and book about lipedema. And lipedema is unique in everyone. Um, no two women present in exactly the same way. No two women have maybe the same comorbidities, the same stages, or the same clinical history. So it makes treatment for lipedema and sometimes diagnosis for lipedema challenging. So um, we've come together and I'll talk a little bit about our collaborative approach but this is what we do. We work with um, mostly lipedema ladies, though some with lipolymphedema, to develop an actionable implementation plan so that they can take small steps day by day so they can establish self-care routines, reduce, eliminate uh, weight, volume, pain, swelling, to regain mobility, or in some cases to prevent immobility and to establish routines and processes so they can live at home befriending their own bodies. Uh, if you're on this webinar, you know lymphedema and lipedema are both extremely disfiguring disorders and come with a lot of issues. So just a little bit about me, and I think the thing that's most important is that I have lipedema, lymphedema, and I've struggled with obesity for many, many, many years. And so I come to this exploring, looking for answers, and I can say very gratefully, meeting with my colleagues um, and forming a multidisciplinary approach to treatment. So uh, Dr. Carmody, you can read his credentials, which are quite impressive, 
But I know him first as a primary care physician. When I, um, I was his patient at that time, we're now <laughs> colleagues. Um, and when I started asking questions and looking for answers, what's unique about Dr. Carmody is that he listened, he explored, he moved into discovery and he partnered with me. And if it wasn't for Dr. Carmody, I would never have found the answers or been able to develop what we are now doing. And uh, so he'll be chatting with you shortly. And um, Leslyn Keith, I met at the National Institute of Health. She is a, um, like in Star Trek, exploring lands that haven't been explored before. <laughs> And uh, when I met Leslyn, she was presenting her research at the first symposium for the lymphatic disorders at NIH in Bethesda that Bill Rapisi and Stan Roxon had been instrumental in making happen. So I met Leslyn and she was presenting her research. Her research which was looking at a ketogenic way of eating for lymphedema and, um, and her work was around lymphedema and obesity. And when we met, we both looked at each other and said, hmm, I wonder if this could work for lipedema. And we met in 2015 and started to collaborate in 2016. And a lot of what you're gonna hear today is a result of these partnering. And Megan, Megan Pfeffer um, was on, she's from Australia. She was on one of our webinars and her questions and comments and discussions were so insightful that we began a conversation and she joined with us a couple of years ago to sort of round out this multidisciplinary approach. And, um, and she'll talk more about um, her approach. So at the time, we were looking for some key. What was it? Is there something that we could know about um, lymphatic disorders and fat disorders that would help. And so we began to explore, this is going back several years, a holistic approach. And again, because lipedema is so complex, as well as lymphedema, because of the many other aspects, we began to develop a multidimensional approach that consists of physical, mental, psychological, emotional, spiritual and social aspects. And we started a masterclass series. In the beginning, it was experimentation. And this is one of our more current grads. This is Kathy. She um, had been heavier than here. This is when she started with us in May of 2019. And um, something to know is that she had had a heart attack. She had many severe comorbidities and um, her doctors had given up on her and told her there was nothing that they could do for her. She had pretty severe lipolymphedema um, and um, was mostly immobile. Um, so um, the second she had lost um, a little bit over 30 pounds, it took her some months to do that. And then uh, she continued to lose. And um, I asked her to send a picture and this is her with 102 pounds. It took her about 18 months. And um, Megan was her coach and she, and she worked with all of us in our master class. So um, this is a timeline. What we've found um, is that um, this is what we have experienced or seemingly with a lot of the patients that we work with, then a miracle occurs. And I think you should be more explicit here in step two. And I'm happy to say my colleagues are gonna get more explicit in step two. And I will just say that what we always hope for is that we start any kind of a treatment process, that we have some kind of transformation and that we're done. Unfortunately, that's not what happens. What happens is something more like we need to take one step and then another 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 and then another. And then some days it's okay and some days not so much. It's a very up and down process, especially with the diseases we deal with. 
And it's that way for the rest of our lives. And so, you know, starting any kind of treatment or any kind of plan can be very daunting. And so the only impossible journey is the one you never begin. And we encourage start, start anywhere, just start. And together is better. So we do it in community. So for each of the dimensions that I mentioned, there are uh, action items and plans that we support the women in implementing, but each woman has to choose the order. Each woman has to know what's right for her. And sometimes that is the learning process. And so within each dimension, as each woman finds more knowledge, begins to uncover what's right for her and her body. And what we strive for, what we work for, what we work with our women um, is to get to, in the physical domain, well-being, mental, psychological, unknowing, understanding, having knowledge. In the social domain, a sense of belonging, in emotional, compassion, and especially self-compassion, since these diseases bring with them such harsh self-judgment. And in a spiritual dimension, a sense of presence, a presence for oneself. And this is the physio-psychosocial model that we work from. And very simply, community is nurturing, mentoring is supportive, and knowledge is powerful. And um, that's my information. I'm happy to hear from you. And I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Carmody. Hi, my name is uh, Matt Carmody. And um, I'm um, a um, physician who is has been involved in lipedema for some years. And um, I'm very happy to be here with you and uh, to sort of like think about uh, uh, my, my topics with you. Um, I wanted to uh, just uh, go a little bit with you over the objectives here is that in 10 minutes, I wanna kind of secure our diagnostic method uh, used to distinguish the diseases of lymphedema, lipedema, and nutritional uh, and, and uh, uh, obesity. And um, this has really been done in great detail and, um, and, and well, well, uh, well worked out by um, the guidelines that are published in the Netherlands, uh, UNI, uh, UK, and also Germany. Uh, there's new guidelines out as well from the European consensus. Um, so I'm not going through those guidelines. That really is not my um, uh, issue today. Um, and what I want to do is I also want to describe an emerging emerging clinical markers for lipedema. So um, what I want to do is I want to actually go to the guidelines, but tell you that there's uh, a problem. And the first problem is that is that physicians that are not um, familiar with lipedema have not been working in lipedema. Look at these guidelines, and they actually do not uh, take to these guidelines with a sense of confidence. So that includes uh, uh, PAs, um, nurse practitioners, physicians. If they look at all of this, the guidelines, and they try to do a history using the guidelines and a physical examination um, uh, with the guidelines, it's really quite difficult to actually have confidence if somebody is not coaching you. And so the problem here is we are not coaching those of us who know this stuff, are not coaching those who don't or not communicating effectively. So these are published, but I have a feeling that published isn't enough. So I'll give you an example. One of the, the central tenets of making this diagnosis is realizing that the distribution is asymmetric of this, uh, is very disproportionate uh, in, the, in the sense of where the obesity occurs. And so the, in lipedema, it's bilateral and most frequently affects the legs, hips, buttocks, uh, and may infect the arms. And, um, and so I'm gonna give you a challenge and I'm gonna show you these two women. And I'm going to say, which one has the diagnosis of lipedema, which one has the diagnosis of obesity. And if you can read the little small print in the bottom, you know that the, lipedema, the woman with lipedema is on the left, woman with uh, obesity is on the right. 
And you can see the disproportion. This is quite easy. Uh, this is, you can pick this up. Um, but imagine, I have given you here sort of the android uh, obese woman. And imagine that I gave you the gynoid obese woman. So now her obesity is going to actually be, and you can see the diagram, around her hips, which would make her quite like the woman with lipedema. So you can, you can see that, you can see that uh, this is, is quite um, a, a conundrum, especially for somebody who's just coming into this, to have enough confidence to say that, oh, that, that fatty tissue is below the waist and it's particular. If you apply all the other criteria, it does become clear, but people don't have confidence. So I'll give you another uh, point of uh, not confident. Texture is very important here. Imagine that I was telling you, uh, you know, apply your, your thumb and uh, uh, fingers to this uh, a fat, a fat fold in this woman's arm as the pink arrow is showing you. And I want you to imagine that you are feeling a hard lentil sized or chickpea sized uh, granule in the adipose tissue or that the tissue is actually has bigger granules matted and not very pliable. Uh, the first is stage one or two, the second is stage three. If you did not do this examination with me and gain some confidence about what your finger was feeling, I can, I can tell you lentils and chickpeas, but unless you've really done that and had confirmation that what you're feeling is exactly that, there's a, a leap here that's very difficult to make for the uh, practitioner that hasn't had a lot of, of, of experience. So I'm realizing that's one of our big problems. So I think that lipedema is, an, is uh, an unfamiliar form of obesity and that there's a low confidence in applying the clinical criteria and that we really need to uh, actually get a way of reaching out to physicians and actually showing them this, this, this examination and making it real for them. The other thing is that coexisting disease is confusing this, this ability to make the diagnosis. And unfortunately, obesity in the United States at least, coexists with, uh, with lipedema 80% of the time. So you always have the two diagnoses together and you can't quite pull them apart. And finally, the diagnosis also implies that you have a network of co-providers. You don't make this diagnosis and stand there alone. Um, you have to have a team that actually can take care of this patient because they have a lot of complex, uh, they have a complex illness, um, a disease. And so you need people like PT, OT, diet specialists, exercise specialists, and psychologists. So given the fact that, the, um, that, that this is our current status um, and that we can apply criteria and we are gonna to try to improve the method of making the diagnosis. The, the thing that we must do next is exploit non-clinical tests to actually confirm diagnoses. And this has never been, been, um, been um, uh, never have, we have never seen this in uh, past time. So the things that I'm gonna present you are actually things that have uh, occurred in 2020. Um, some some are, are, are before that time. But I wanna prevent, I want to present you four markers of which I think probably the first two are, are going to be very close to what we need in a, in a short time. The first is platelet factor four, and you probably have heard uh, something about that if you have actually been uh, in the lipedema community. Uh, lipedema community. Um, as you know, this is a, what's called an exosome. So here you have a cell over here on the right side, the blue cell, and you see a little blip on its surface. That little blip on the surface is an, an extrusion or an exosome that contains this platelet factor four. And so it is being put into the circulation. And, and fortunately, the platelet factor four is a biomarker of lymph lymphatic vascular dysfunction in lipedema. So if you, we can measure this platelet factor four, it's highly specific for the diagnosis of lipedema. 
Uh, it, it is not present in people with obesity. It is not present in people that, 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 that have no problems with their weight. Um, so it is very highly specific. So that's a superb uh, marker. The second marker that I wanna tell you about is tissue sodium and adipose content. Again, presented in 2020, it's a biomarker which it, that there is specific sodium and, uh, 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 and uh, in skin and in uh, subcutaneous fat, there is a specific level of sodium uh, that is for lipidemic patients exceeds all other types of obesity that is exceeds the amount of sodium in those tissues found in obesity. And the way that it is done is the, done with a conventional proton um, uh, MRI, which is adjusted also to send sodium. I've depicted this as um, a, I've given you a little biopsy of skin, which has on the top of it has uh, uh, obviously the, uh, the epidermis and then the fat. And then the sodium in both of those uh, areas is actually high uh, compared to all other diagnoses. So it's very highly specific. Both of these tests have been done in a very small number of people. So we would first look for them to be in, uh, applied to a very uh, a larger population. We would hope that platelet factor four actually becomes available as a blood sample. Um, an exosome is somewhat difficult to to take apart and to, um, and to express for simple uh, calculation, but those are, are, the, are really our future. Um, I'm gonna, there is um, MR lymph, uh, lymphangiography, which I'm not gonna spend a lot of time about because it does not distinguish uh, be between lymphedema and lipedema. Um, but there is, there is a story there that makes it useful, especially if you're dealing with a lipidemic patient and you're suspecting that they're ma making a transition to lymphedema. This is a superb test to know that they're making that transition. And this is pretty exciting. I know that we're all talking about cytokine milieus, you know, in obesity and um, inflammatory conditions, but there is a milieu that is uh, peculiar uh, to lymphedema. And it has to do with the fact that lymphedema is a fat proliferation. That fat proliferation then demands more circulation and, uh, and more lymphogenesis. Uh, it, it needs to have more of that. And cytokines uh, by other cells, and I'll sort of give you a little bit of this, by other cells, if you put these, this, if you put the, this uh, expanded hypertrophied uh, uh, fat tissue in this, uh, uh, in this capillary bed with uh, lymphatics as well, uh, you actually stress this bed. So what you have is you have uh, um, a marked increase in, um, in, in um, uh, endothelial growth factor. Uh, so what, what the uh, vascular endothelial growth factor that's common here is you want to grow blood vessels because you have to meet the demands of this hypertrophy tissue. Uh, and you actually have to uh, um, uh, grow lymphatics because you have to take the, the waste or the high flow that occurs to this area because you have increased your circulation to this area. If you don't increase the circulation, then that fat tissue starts to uh, actually necrose and also it starts to inflame. Um, these are conditions that we now know occur. Now, as it turns out, um, uh, going back for a second, uh, it, VG, uh, VEGFC is actually uh, increased and it is actually a signal for more um, lymph vessels to, uh, to um, uh, grow. Uh, what is also a marker which goes in the opposite direction, you want angiogenesis as well, or blood vessels to grow. And it appears that, uh, at least in the early studies, that, that that demand or that demand is not met. So there is a signaling disparity here in terms of what uh, the uh, hypertrophy of uh, uh, fat tissue, um, fat cells in um, in lipedema is asking for. So we could take advantage of that 
um, special marking or that strange marking uh, and actually devise testing uh, through blood serum uh, and ELISA uh, uh, cytokine uh, quantification. We might be able to get a marker out of that combination. So um, these are my references. Um, and uh, they are, you know, the, the basic references on um, lipedema in terms of um, uh, uh, examination, as well as the particular references for the studies that uh, tell us about the new um, um, uh, developments here. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Carmody. Hi, I'm Megan Pfeffer. I'm a clinical nutritionist and working with Lipedema Simplified in the USA. And I have Lipedema myself. I'm so happy to be presenting to you today. And I'll be presenting a new perspective on Lipedema nutrition, the ketogenic diet. I don't have any disclosures. So we'll be talking about what is a ketogenic diet, benefits, cautions, and contraindications, foods to increase and foods to decrease, what a day of keto food might look like, should we be restricting or increasing dietary sodium intake, and ketogenic diet's influence on lipid profiles and other markers of metabolic health, so what is nutritional ketosis? It's essentially the switching of the body's fuel source or primary fuel source from glucose to fatty acids and ketones. So switching from glucose helps to lower the fat storage hormone insulin. And when we switch to using fatty acids and ketones as our fuel source, the body then fuels itself from both dietary fats and stored fats. And also the body can uh, produce its own glucose uh, when it's required um, by a, a process called gluconeogenesis in the liver. So nutritional ketosis isn't defined by just adding some extra fat into your meals. Uh, we define it by uh, measuring serum beta hydroxybutyrate. And this needs to be at levels above 0 0.5 millimolars per litre. To, um, to show that people have entered a state of, of ketosis. And for women with lipedema, we actually like them to be in a slightly deeper level of, um, of ketosis or therapeutic nutritional ketosis, which is a serum beta-hydroxybutyrate, um, the ketone, at levels between 1.5 to 3 millimoles per litre. So there are some uh, instances where ketogenic diets aren't appropriate. Uh, or where they need to be medically monitored. So they are not appropriate for people with chronic kidney and liver disease or with people with born um, fat metabolism defects. They um, need to be, people need to be medically monitored if they have conditions such as gout, uh, type one or type two diabetes, hypertension, um, if people are, are breastfeeding or during pregnancy. And we need to, of course, always make sure that um, people's medical team are aware of, um, of dietary changes that, that they're making. Prescribed medications, uh, and this is a big one, um, particularly for people who have um, type 2 diabetes and are um, on prescription medication, particularly if they're taking insulin, blood glucose levels can start dropping quite dramatically. Um, pretty much straight away as soon as you start drastically lowering carbohydrates. And some of these medications will need to be adjusted from the outset. Some of them will need to be adjusted when they're ongoing. And that includes even things like people may be inc including a lot more green leafy vegetables. And so that can affect the blood thinning medications um, that need to be more closely monitored. So the key areas addressed by a ketogenic diet 
uh, of course, adipose hypertrophy, which is um, you know reducing the size of the of the size of the fat cells, um, and balancing hormones, um, hunger and satiety hormones. Um, fat storage hormones like insulin as well. Inflammation, which is a key driving factor in lipedema, so reducing in inflammation. Um, also edema and, and pain, which are very common for women with lipedema. Uh, a ketogenic diet helps to address those and, and reduce those. And also lipid, pro lipid profiles, a lot of people are concerned about what will happen to cholesterol when you're doing a ketogenic diet and we'll go into some studies that show that it can help to improve um, lipid profiles. So a well-balanced ketogenic diet is really looking at doing things um, or increasing things like the healthy fats from fruit trees and animals and when I say fruit trees we're talking about extra virgin olive oils, um, avocado oils and uh, coconut oils. Uh, we like to increase low carbohydrate fruit and vegetables. We look at increasing uh, electrolytes and of course hydration and also at uh, improving and increasing uh, gut health. At the same time, we look at uh, reducing total and refined carbohydrates. And not only that, but of course, focusing on the healthy fats, we're really looking to reduce the industrialized seed oils and um, because they're so high in omega-6s and that omega-6 to omega-3 ratio when that's imbalanced uh, can be very pro-inflammatory and when I say industrialized seed oils what I'm really meaning is vegetable oils there are no vegetables in vegetable oil they're, they're um, actually the seed oils and they're very highly processed and, and often oxidized we want to reduce things like nut flowers and sweeteners for the lipedema community. Uh, a lot of people when they're doing keto or low carb will start doing a lot of baking using nut flowers as a replacement flour. Uh, we find this to be very inflammatory. Again, it, it disrupts that omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. Um, sweeteners can still spike insulin and blood glucose levels. So we don't find that for people who are wanting to, to heal and to lose weight, that's helpful. And also we like to lower gut irritants and food intolerances, which can be very uh, common in uh, women with lipedema, particularly as, um, as it progresses. So uh, we look at uh, the target macronutrients. So what we're essentially doing is we have the same amount of protein. It's a moderate protein diet. It's not a, it's not a high protein diet, as a lot of people will say. So it's a moderate protein diet. And instead of having the high carbohydrates and low fat, we're really just switching those two macronutrients around so that we have a higher fat and a lower carbohydrate. So what that means is that we are looking to, to lower carb, carbohydrates initially to less than 50 grams. We'll have, usually get people into ketosis. Sometimes it needs to be a little bit lower depending on someone's metabolic health. Um, ultimately, we like to get that under 20 grams of total carbohydrates. Um, because that, that lowers insulin e even further and we, we believe really can really help with lowering inflammation, which is so important with, uh, for women with lipedema. And as I mentioned, moderate, um, moderate protein and then the healthy fats, and we focus on the quality fats um, and eating to satiety, meaning that there's not really a strict formula as far as fats are concerned. It's what you need to put on your plate to help you feel full. Uh, your body can also access the fat on your body uh, when it needs extra extra fat. And of course, sodium levels. Sodium uh, often needs to be, uh, does need to be increased on ketogenic diets. Um, and we'll go through why that is in a moment. So this is what a typical day on a ketogenic diet can look like. As you can see, there's certainly not a shortage of food. It's not about calorie restriction. This is one of the reasons why women enjoy a ketogenic diet because yes, you're taking away some you know, potatoes or bread or, or some, some of those um, carbohydrates, but you're putting in a lot of foods that are really satisfying. And so you're eliminating that hunger aspect that's quite common with dieting and, and people are feeling really satisfied. And including foods that are um, full of healthy fats is uh, a good replacement for the carbohydrates 
that leaves people satisfied. So starting, you know, with coffee, some perhaps scrambled eggs with uh, with avocado and some some smoked salmon. Um, you might have some cream in your coffee to go with that. Um, using uh, bone broth to help balance electrolytes and is also good for gut health and joint health. Um, there's uh, some, you know, um, pork belly with some some baked cabbage. Uh, to go with a salad with a fresh homemade um, mayonnaise full of extra virgin olive oil. Um, snacking usually happens at the beginning with keto when people have some carbohydrate cravings and that's fine. Things like parmesan crisps and some dip or some cheese. And of course, there's some um, salt. Those teaspoons aren't sugar, <laughs> they're salt. And uh, the, the salt is really important to keep our electrolyte levels up. And of course, a pesto chicken with some mashed broccoli or, or mashed cauliflower, and then perhaps some low carbohydrate fruit with some cream. So should we re be restricting sodium? Well, we know that when, when there's a high carbohydrate diet, um, that leads to high insulin, which changes how the kidneys handle sodium. So there, there's going to be higher sodium, whereas when you lower insulin, uh, it low, um, you do that by lowering carbohydrates, insulin will come down and that increases sodium excretion. So um, what that does essentially is it normalises sodium metabolism. And so this um, acts as a natural diuretic. So for women who have edema, and we're not necessarily talking about the extra sodium that's inside, um, that's inside the cells, but for women who have edema, it can act as a natural diuretic and help to release some of that. So as far as low sodium diets are concerned, um, salt and cardiovascular disease, uh, a recent, very recent study from this year shows that there is insufficient evidence to recommend low, low sodium intake, which is normally classified as less than 2,300 milligrams. Um, additionally, low sodium intake increases aldosterone to conserve sodium, also leading uh, to potassium wasting, promoting a negative effect on the heart, muscles and nerves. And low sodium intake increases adrenal production of stress hormones, cortisol and adrenaline, causing blood sugar dysregulation, insulin resistance, poor sleep and low energy. And all of these are areas of concern in women with lipedema. So with sodium, we increase that usually um, between 3,000 and 5,000 milligrams per day depending on if someone has lymphedema uh, involvement and what medication someone might, might be on, so we always check those first. HDL is improved uh, for people on a ketogenic diet. Uh, having low HDL levels is thought to be a higher cardiovascular disease risk factor and increasing HDL can be cardioprotective. This year-long intervention study on 118 obese men and women compared a very low-carbohydrate diet with a low-fat diet. The participants in the low-fat study increased HDL by 4.9%. In the very low-carbohydrate group, the HDL was increased by 20.6%, almost four times as much as the low-fat group. So LDL can be measured two ways, LDL-C measuring total concentration in the blood or LDL-P, which measures the number and size of particles in the blood. Recent research has called into question the effectiveness of measuring LDL-C concentration compared to the particle numbers. After reviewing cross-sectional data, a recent peer-reviewed paper from the world-renowned Framingham Heart Study, which had over 14,000 participants from three generations, stated that in a large community-based sample, LDLP was a more sensitive indicator of low CBD risk than either LDLC or non-HDLC, suggesting a potential clinical role for LDLP as a goal of LDL management. So while the low carbohydrate diet in this particular study did not lower total LDL cholesterol, it did result in a shift from small dense LDL to large buoyant LDL, which could lower cardiovascular risk. And here high fat intake combined with carbohydrate restriction raises the levels of larger sized LDL, which are known to be less atherogenic than the small dense LDL. 
So in this uh, in this paper, um, we uh, which compared a low fat diet with a low carbohydrate diet, there was better participant retention, uh, which is an important factor, and greater weight loss. And during the the weight loss, serum triglyceride levels and um, decreased, which is another important um, step in the in the lipid profile. And there were more high density lipoprotein cholesterol levels compared with the low fat diets. And in this two year study, which is considered a long term study, there were clinically significant improvements in the HbA1c uh, metabolic syndrome rate and markers of inflammation. So reductions from baseline to two years included not only the HbA1c fasting, glucose fasting, insulin weight, systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, triglycerides and liver enzymes, as well as increasing HDL. So there's some references and some more references there for you. Thank you very much for your attention. And I will hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Leslie Key. Thank you, Megan. I'm just gonna share with you very quickly some trends in treatment for lipedema. Um, and what I'm gonna be showing you here is some things that are currently still being studied and they're clinical trials, but some things that have been out there for a while. And I just was gonna show, share with you some of the evidence for um, adding these to your uh, option for treatment for lipedema. I have no disclosures and this disclaimer has already been talked about. So th these treatment suggestions that I am making should never be inputted with, uh, implemented unless you've consulted with your physician. So as we know, first we got to start with our conservative lipedema management and treatment should always include complete decongestive therapy and um, modified for the uh, patient. So a combination of MLD skin care, compression therapy and exercise. And then also part of a conservative treatment, I believe should be nutrition. And I think as we've just heard from Megan that the optimal um, diet for lipedema may well be a ketogenic diet. But if you're doing all these things and you still want to do more for your lipedema, what else can we do? And so I'm going to share with you just a few things that are on the horizon that you might look into further. And then one is controlling environmental artificial estrogens, also managing fibrosis through medication, vibration therapy, and also cavitation and shockwave therapy. So first, when we look at estrogen, um, there, estrogen has a, a particular impact on lipedema. This was a paper written by Cicel and, and colleagues, uh, pathological um, dilemmas in lipedema. And they, one of the things they were talking about was estrogen and its possible impact on lipedema. And it can have both central and peripheral effects affecting the adipose uh, proliferation and deposit to the lower body and other factors as well. So we believe that estrogen does have an impact. And so sh should we be looking at the, the exposure to artificial estrogens in our environment that could upset um, this balance in our body even further? So we have natural estrogens that are supposed to have a particular balance, um, but there are everyday exposure to artificial estrogens that can block artificial uh, can block receptors because they mimic they look just like these molecules. So let's look at several of those. They could be plant estrogens, and the highest uh, plants that have the highest level of artificial estrogens are soy, soy and flax, um, and I think a lot of people have heard about soy. It, it, apparently flax even has even a higher amount of concentration of artificial estrogens. And then lavender, we don't usually ingest that, but it is used a lot as a topical and it does have quite a bit of artificial um, estrogen. And then mold estrogen, and this is more than just um, the molds that you see in your basement. Apparently there is quite a, a problem with how grains are stored in this country and there is a uh, higher degree of, of uh, molds that are allowed in storage and so um, particularly looking at those grains it, it might be a good um, thing to look at. And then herbicides and I just put down these two most common glyphosate and atrazine but there are many herbs herbicides that have um, things that mimic estrogens. 
and fragrances. Again, many different things, but the one that most people are familiar with is those parabens. And then plastics, uh, I think a lot of people know about that. Um, and then particularly when it's uh, heated. So thinking about that um, plastic bo bottle of water and then it's, it's heated up in your car, then you're gonna get outgassing even more of those estrogens. Birth control pill, we know of course that's an artificial estrogen and then also artificial red dyes. So how can you reduce your exposure? Because these things are just in everyday life. Well, one thing you can do, and when you adopt a ketogenic diet, you will be limiting um, or eliminating completely soy and flax from your diet. You can um, avoid the use of any kind of lavender oils. You can avoid, here's where we um, kind of avoid any kind of grain, particularly wheat when we eat a ketogenic diet. Um, try and eat organic foods, and this will limit your exposure to herbicides. It's not always possible, but trying to um, limit that exposure as much as you can. Um, a lot of those artificial estrogens end up in the water, and so just filtering with activated charcoal will take care of that. Using only fragrance-free um, products, storing your food in glass and stainless steel in you if you can, particularly if it's if you're storing it um, when it's still hot or warm um, using glass or stainless steel. 100% cotton clothing and linens uh, will be more beneficial and washing them before you use them. And then um, sweating, uh, you find that you can emit, uh, get rid of these chemicals best through sweat, even better than urination. So if you can uh, tolerate using a sauna, that would be beneficial, but it just uh, being able to sweat at least 10 minutes a day is gonna help. So let's look at what's happening with this fibrosis uh, reducing medication. And this is a, uh, uh, medication that is an injectable medication that's still under trial. I give you the, the link for the clinical trials. Um, and so it is looking at treatment of women with lipedema involving substantial fat above the knee or of women and men with nodular Durkheim's disease. So this is an, an injectable medication that's particularly for lipedema and, um, and Durkheim's. Originally it was for obesity and just trying to find a way to get rid of excess of fat with obesity, but they found a way to really, um, it, it might actually benefit women with lipedema as well. So in this first arm of the study, they had 12 participants and it was completed in 2019. I was able to get some results from this uh, lipedema blog by Carol Noguera, um, and she showed this picture of that um, inner thigh fat nodule. And after 14 days, that was the response that they had. And so that injection, it just kills cells in the immediate injected area. So it's very directed. And they found an average of a 50% reduction in size of the nodules. And even better was 70% reduction in pain levels. And then they ha do have a second arm. And this is going to be active through 2021. The drug is RZL. Um, dash 012. And so the second arm, they'll have 38 subjects in three different centers. They're going to randomize them into the drug or a placebo group. And it's going to be double blinded, meaning that neither the person administering the, the injection or the participant is going to know whether or not they're getting the drug. And then after the study is over, the placebo patients can will be offered to use the drug if they wish. And there is the clinical trial link for you. So now let's talk a little bit about vibration therapy. And a lot of you might, might have heard this. And there's actually quite a bit of literature that's been written on vibration therapy. This is just a, a typical vibration plate, but they, they come in all different permutations, all different makers. Um, a lot of them will have a, a handrail that you can hold on to. You stand on it and you get full body vibration because it shakes. So here's a study um, in 2018, and it was 30 women with lipedema, and most of them were stage two, and um, they were technically obese with a BMI of 35.6. And in this study, they were comparing MLD versus doing MLD plus fibrotherapy, and they had six treatments over three weeks, and they measured the limb volume, and they also looked at health-related quality of life. 
And there you can see the results. And they had results just with MLD, but they had substantially better results in all the limb volumes and all those different areas they measured when they did MLD plus the vibrotherapy, and that's the gray taller column. And the same thing here too, um, when the MLD was only applied, they had improvements, but you see the lighter gray column um, under each of those categories, all those quality of life categories, it was substantially better when they had an MLD plus fibrotherapy. So in the various studies I looked at, um, they had various benefits for vibration for lipedema specifically in that population. Pain relief was major, improving circulation, improved quality of life as we just saw. Interestingly, there was improved bone density in several studies, not necessarily on women with lipedema, but in other populations, enhanced relaxation. And also in another population, um, it was used for constipation. So now we're going to look at shockwave therapy, and uh, some of them uh, really use the cavitation. And the cavitation is actually these bubbles, these little micro bubbles that are formed in the tissues. And that's because of that pressure from the, uh, the acoustic wave that is causing these bubbles to be formed and then expanded and then collapsed. And um, so this energy that's being transported into the tissue can be used for various things. So this is a study in um, 2006, and they were trying to figure out what actually is the mechanism of action. They see that it seems to have an impact and it seems to work, but what's happening? And so what they were suggesting is that when you administer the shock wave, it, it makes all these various biological responses and those biological responses lead to um, improved blood supply, which then can help with the tissue regeneration, bone repair, tendon repair. So the effects of shock wave just on the general population, we see that we get new blood vessel formation, increased blood circulation and lymph drainage, reduced inflammation, collagen projection production and um, pain decrease. And you can see how all these would be beneficial to a woman with lipedema. Here's a study in Germany, and they um, actually put people into two groups. They had a woman with lipedema and then they had a control group and they had six treatments over two weeks using the shockwave therapy, they just did that on one thigh. And then on both thighs, they did CDT. So manual lift range and compression. And then um, at the end of the time, they, they tested for those blood markers. They looked at what was the blood, uh, several markers that showed oxidative stress inflammation. And then also they did a test for skin elasticity. And so you can see here the results of the test. Now up in the upper left, you see before lipedema compared to the control group and how much higher that blood marker is in just the beginning for the baseline for women with lipedema. And then after six weeks of shockwave therapy, that uh, light blue one on the third bar over, you can see how it's substantially reduced, but it still didn't get down to the control. And that's the same results that they had for the other blood marker in the bottom left. And then on the um, right-hand um, graph, we see that we just, uh, com we were comparing one thigh to the other in the lipedema women and over the six different treatments. And um, they had a substantial difference between the two thighs by the sixth treatment. And then here is uh, combining also vacuum uh, property. So a suction property with the cavitation and the shock wave. And so um, this is not necessarily the device that they used um, in the study, but I just wanted to show you that it was with a, an applicator like that done to the area that you want to treat. And in this one, they were actually comparing um, what they called in the study vacuum cavitation therapy with liposuction. So that was the two groups. And they measured um, uh, the, the circumference of the thigh, and they also did a skin fold test and the um, vacuum cavitation therapy was actually carried out over a period of three months. And so it's very interesting results because you can see the first study group here is the vacuum cavitation group. And the second study group is the liposuction group. And you can see they started out virtually the same and they had um, both had a significant reduction. The actually the vacuum cavitation group took longer, but was non-invasive, actually had a slightly better um, thigh circumference measure at the end of the study. And the, the results were the same also for, um, for the, the skin fold. 
So um, both were effective, uh, slightly more effective for the vacuum cavitation. And it was, it takes longer, but it's non-invasive. And then I have uh, uh, references here for you for um, the artificial estrogen studies, the vibration and the cavitation and the shock wave therapy. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, so um, I'm gonna take this one question that got put in the chat, but then she moved it over to the Q and A. Um, and that was uh, to Dr. Carmody. And when will the first two markers be available for a, uh, a general practitioner to prescribe? I think that was the PF4 and also the sodium levels. Right. Um, so I think that both, just having appeared 2020, uh, need to go through a trial um, that's much bigger than the one that was used um, in uh, establishing uh, the efficacy of being able to distinguish lipidema from other diseases. So I think that that is probably, you know, something that is, you know, ongoing, especially for the uh, sodium MRI. Uh, MRI. Um, we, there are more studies being done with that. So I think that that's going to be the first one go, uh, going on. And then um, I'm not sure when the PF4 is coming on. Maybe, and some, maybe some of the other panelists have an idea um, uh, about that timing, if Stanley has told you. Um, yeah, I think it's a while. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, he's, the last we spoke, he's working on it. And he's pretty effective at what he does, so hopefully soon. <laughs> but that would be the simple, you know that that would be again a very simple trial. Uh, these are not these these are modalities that you know are available, and so the trials take a while. You know, for enrollment design approval or uh, uh, enrollment and um, uh, uh, dissemination of the result. So mm -hmm. I think we're on clinical et cetera for another two years, um, unless you can be part of a study. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, the, the next um, two questions I'm gonna combine and they're both for Megan. Um, one uh, person asks, how do we get into ketosis and how do we know if we're there? And can you tag on to that? Um, another person also wants to know what sugar substitutes is it okay to have when we're on keto occasionally? <laughs> Yeah, sure. Okay. So, um, so as far as getting into ketosis, that's about reducing your carbohydrate intake. So it's going to be reducing your carbohydrates to certainly to less than 50 grams of carbohydrates per day. For some people that may need to be lower. And ideally for women with lipidema, we like it below 20 grams, but initially it can be, it can be a little bit higher, but of course that will be depending on your metabolic health. Some people with more deranged metabolic health will need to keep that uh, a little bit lower. Um, measuring if you're in ketosis, which is really important because you don't want to be reducing your carbohydrate fuel source without making sure that you're entering ketosis so that you can access the fat as the fuel source. Um, and you can, you can measure that initially with urine strip testing and to show that you're in ketosis. You can also uh, measure that with a, you can get glucose and ketone blood monitors that can also, um, so you can do a little finger prick test that can, sh um, to show that you're in, in ketosis. Um, and uh, as far as using sweeteners are concerned, we don't recommend a lot of sweeteners um, because you really need to reset your taste buds which become so accustomed to everything tasting sweet. We, we you know, sugar's put in everything nowadays. So we, we're constantly seeking that sweet taste. So we really recommend initially, you know, going, going without the sweeteners um, and just including the healthy fats instead um, because it can really help you reset that that you know your, your your level of what you require and that can really create that freedom um, from you know always seeking these sweet foods um, there are some sweeteners of course for some people who have uh, you know are coming from a really high carbohydrate diet or perhaps soft, soft drinks full of sugars and things like that sometimes using sweeteners is a really good transition thing to help you get through that which is perfectly fine to help you transition um, of course artificial sweeteners um, create their own health problems and we don't recommend artificial sweeteners some some sweeteners like xylitol can still spike insulin levels um, so that's not ideal either we typically recommend stevia and things like um, monk fruit 
um, and erythritol. Uh, erythritol is a sugar alcohol that creates some prob problems for some people with digestive issues. So, yes, we would typically be looking at something like stevia and monk fruit for sweetness. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, this next one's for Catherine. Um, I thought you would be best to respond to this and maybe Megan also. Um, one person asked, how can garment manufacturers better support a, the lipedema patients? And since you two actually have lipedema and probably use compression, um, uh, how can the garment manufacturers best support this population? Um, I think um, there are some very good garments that are already there. I think when you get into the higher advanced stages of lipolymphedema, lip that it gets more complicated because custom garments are incredibly expensive. So I will give a shout out to Heather Ferguson and the work that she's doing with the Lipedema Treatment Act. Um, my goodness, through everything that's gone on in Washington, Heather and her group has continually sought to get um, a passage of a bill to provide custom and garments, period, garments and custom garments um, through, um, um, through Medicare. And so um, anything anybody can do, uh, just go to Lipedema um, Treatment I think it's called lymphedema advocacy. Lymphedema, anyway. lymphedema. Yeah, lymphedema, I'm sorry. I have lymphedema on the mind. <laughs> um, I'll get the link and put it in the chat. Mm -hmm. But okay. the work that they're doing is just amazing. And, uh, and they've done it for years and they're very, very close to getting the bill passed. Okay. Um, I am going to just uh, respond to a couple questions here myself. Uh, one person asks about 100% um, pure la lavender oil. Wouldn't that be better because it wouldn't have uh, additives? And unfortunately, it's just the makeup of lavender itself. There was actually quite a few published studies that were showing um, mm -hmm. that lavender oil um, uh, applied mm -hmm. to infants actually caused, um, you know, 18 month old to start uh, menstruating because of the amount of, of estrogen in lavender. So a little bit once in a while, not gonna be bad, but just keep in mind that lavender itself without any additives has a lot of estrogen, uh, artificial estrogen. And then also, um, uh, um, one person made the point that, you know, when you're using compression, it might be hard to get a hundred percent cotton. And that's very, very true that a lot of compression has a lot of other materials, particularly to make it elastic. It's not always going to be hundred percent cotton, but there are a couple of, uh, at least off the shelf, um, lower compression garments that are, are, are cotton. But if you are someone that needs a lot of that stiffness and a lot of uh, greater amount of compression that you might have some of those uh, petroleum materials that um, might cause a problem. But you know, you just do your best, do what you can. And maybe you take away estrogens in another place. Um, how are we doing on time? Can I do a couple more questions? Yes. Okay. Um, Let's look at, um, uh, Megan, you mentioned contradictions with respect to hepatitis B. Are there any reports or insight about uh, how following a ketogenic diet or act, uh, actually influences or otherwise affects, good or bad, someone with chronic hepatitis B and has following a ketogenic diet uh, determined to be potentially or actually detrimental or determined to be beneficial for someone who has chronic hepatitis B? So I think the answer to that, if, if you have chronic hepatitis B, um, which would be a chronic liver condition, that is one of the things that we typically exclude with uh, with a ketogenic diet. I'm not aware specifically of any, uh, I don't, I haven't had a client with um, hepatitis B myself, so I'm not aware of any specific research on ketogenic diets with hepatitis B. Uh, if, but if it's at the chronic stage and you have, you know, liver fibrosis or cirrhosis of the liver, um, then no, a ketogenic diet would be contraindicated. If, uh, if a hepatitis B was sort of more at the beginning stages and the liver wasn't as affected, um, certainly things like having fatty liver and, and improving liver health can be beneficial so but that's really something that you would need to discuss with with a doctor and and perhaps specifically a doctor who is familiar with with 
low carb or ketogenic diets. Mm -hmm. And Catherine, um, an attendee asks, how do we find uh, a lipedema doctor or a treatment team in our area? Um, a, a couple of different ways. Um, LEARN has just recently designated centers of excellence, and there are, I believe, nine of them, and they're all around the world. I know there's one here in Boston, and there's one in California at Stanford, and, um, but you go, if you go on the LEARN website, you'll see, um, um, I think it says centers of excellence, and this just uh, this just this designation just happened somewhere like six months ago. And so the centers are multidisciplinary and they're collaborative and, um, and very successful. We've had um, the group from uh, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center here in Boston called the Lymphatic Center. We had them on and they did an amazing webinar for our community um, just a few months ago. Okay, um, and someone wanted you to post the conference information again in the um, chat. Yeah, I will do that. And a couple people were commenting on that, that shockwave uh, treatment might be painful for lipedema. And absolutely, I mean, if you are, if, if because of the hypersensitivity with your lipedema, if that is painful, that is a good indication that you probably shouldn't be doing it. I'm not one that th thinks that, that you have to have pain in order to have gain. And so um, that is something to, to consider. Now, there are also women that have done it that don't have uh, hypersensitivity and pain to that treatment and find that to be okay. So it, it's going to be highly individual um, on doing that. And I... Um, had something that I was going to ask Dr. Carmody. Um, there's lots of great questions in here. Uh, well done. I wanted to, um, oh, here's what, what it was that I was going to ask Dr. Carmody. Um, we had someone who posted, are you taking patients? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I am recently retired. Um, so the answer to that is no. Um, I would say, um, that if you worked with your primary provider, uh, that would be the first step. If you went to the lipedema, lipedema project and actually there's educational material that you can give your uh, provider if you suspect that you have the diagnosis. And I will tell you that the most, the person that probably has the most chance of knowing about your condition if your primary provider doesn't know is a is definitely a physical therapist and um, that a and a physical therapist that ha has been trained by a man or a doctor named close k l o s e um, who has a website called close.com you can actually get the therapist in your area that has been trained by him which is a very good way. I did this all the time for my patients is that I would just bring them to close.com. We put their, um, their, zip, uh, their zip code in or any type of uh, uh, location, locating information. And they would be able to actually tell us the therapist in that area. So and it's actually close training and consulting. Um, K-O-L-S-E training and consulting. Or, or if you just Google close lymphedema and you'll you'll get to the site okay um i just gave them close.com and they uh -huh. always got there but they it found is, it okay good okay uh -huh. good um megan a uh, person asks um how do you find someone to work with a keto diet for mm -hmm. lipedema or lymphedema with food sensitivities and also um, knowing about other comorbidities such as diverticulitis or not having a gallbladder stuff like that Yes. Okay. So you're really you're wanting to to work with a a qualified um, nutritionist or, or a dietitian that's going to help you with those things because we have the um, the, the the training in those co comorbidities to be able to safely introduce a ketogenic diet. Um, I work as a, a nutritional therapist um, online throughout the US and throughout the world, really through Lipedema Simplified. We have a coaching program there, consulting and coaching program. So you can head over to the lipedema-simplified.com 
um, .org uh, site and ha and have a look there. Um, but working yeah, working closely with um, with someone like myself who is a nutritionist helps you um, can help you work out food intolerances because that can be pretty tricky. And um, people with gut issues often have food intolerances. Sometimes you know it might be from something you've eaten a few days ago because that can take a few days to develop, and it's usually a cumulative effect. So you might have a little bit of something, so you think that food's okay because it hasn't caused any issues, but you might have a bit more of it the next day, and suddenly it, it's creating issues. So working with someone is a great idea because it can be quite tricky to, to discover those things, but it makes such a big difference to quality of life when you can remove all of those, you know, those symptoms that, that come along with food intolerances. So it, it really is something worthwhile investing in to, to, to improve your health. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and um, one person asked, um, what kind of care professional would offer cavitation therapy? And it may be in, uh, I, I know some uh, occupational physical therapists that have these modalities in their clinic. So it might be in a lymphedema clinic, but also it seems to be offered in uh, dermatology clinics and stuff like that. So um, I would just Google it. And from what I saw when I was doing it myself, a lot of the websites that came up were places that were offering the treatment. Um, and then um, several people were asking about um, the references and that each of us used, and also the links to the clinical trials that are currently undergone for, for um, the stuff that Dr. Carmody talked about, the things that I talked about. Um, this uh, presentation is being recorded and it's going to be up on the LEARN site. So you will be able to go back and view it and stop the video at any place to be able to get all those links and all those references for you to be able to follow up on all that information. And um, um, we're going to yes. wrap it up. And, okay. uh, but um, there's many more questions that we can answer. I'll again say, please, we are welcome the um, symposium this weekend will answer a lot of the questions that we see here. Um, and there'll be opportunities to ask Q&A throughout the two days. And the, all of the uh, two days will be available if you can't make any or afterwards as recordings as well. So uh, as you can tell, we're trying very much to help the community to find answers. So um, thank you all. Thank you to my incredible colleagues. <laughs> and it's amazing to work together collaboratively. And that um, quote that we always say is, um, you can do so much more together than you can by yourself. So thank you. And thank you all. We hope you have found some learning and some connection here today. And hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Thanks to Learn for thank having us here. Much.